and welcome to the Milwaukee Poetry Series and to the Pond House. I'm Tom Hogan, the uh, project director for the Milwaukee Poetry Series. Delighted to have you here tonight. So it gives me a, a, a lot of pleasure to introduce our poet and, and reader tonight. Barbara is the author of Peace at Heart, an Oregon Country Life, a memoir published by the Oregon State University Press. Her earlier poetry books include Small Favors, What We Say to Strangers, Love at the Egyptian Theater, and Bees in Wet Weather. She taught at Linfield College from 1983 to 2007 and recently retired to the position of Linfield College Professor Emerita. Her poetry and prose works have appeared in anthologies, and there is a whole list of them, uh, which we could certainly go over, but extensively published, I think is the word. The last two things I wanted to say in introducing Barbara is her book. The last two classes that I took from Jim Grable at Clackamas Community College used writing poetry. The author of writing poetry is our poet tonight, Barbara Drake. Also, I mentioned earlier a wonderful column on Monday by Andy Parker about Barbara. And I wish I could say that I had more responsibility uh, about that column than reporting on it. It was just wonderful. So would you join me in welcoming our poet and our reader tonight, Barbara Drake. Thank you, Tom. It's really nice to be here. I shouldn't make, I, it's kind of a mistake to sit down after I, having a nice dinner with Paul Ann and Dorothy and my husband Bill, and then coming over and sitting down, I felt almost as if I were preparing to listen to somebody and relax, but <laughs> here I am. So, uh, I have a list of things here. I, I don't think I could give a reading the day before Valentine's Day without giving some connection to that. So when I organized my reading, I tried to make that connection. And I have a little section from a some prose. I hope it's okay to introduce prose into this series um, because this was written about 10 years ago, the day before Valentine's Day. And um, it's called Mud. And I know that at this time of year, I, lo I love Oregon all times of year, but living on a farm, we have a lot of mud. And it's the time of year when I start looking for those tulips and primroses in the Safeway, <laughs> you know, and thinking and looking at the quince and everything else that's sort of budding out, the omelaria, and thinking, okay, now it's time for something different. So this is mud. Mud, the color of February in the country. Mud outside the back door, mud on the dog's feet, in the barn, summer gopher holes that came up inside the walls now channel rainwater and create a muddy mess in the ram side of the barn. There is even a sinkhole at the gate. Oregon has record rainfalls this winter. The ground is saturated. Is every winter a record rainfall by him? <laughs> <laughs> Every gully and every stump hole fills with water. Slides have plagued the coast roads. Two miles down the highway, Stiller's Mill Road fell into the creek one night. Russell Creek Road past our place and up the hill has caved into a ravine. And who knows when it will be fixed. Woodland Loop has a big sinkhole in it. Mud and manure, the barn in winter. I go out in my nightgown, jacket, and boots to let the sheep out. Ten good lambs so far, no new ones this morning, one stillborn yesterday. What happened there, we can only guess, we'll never know. Perhaps the ewe didn't get its head cleaned off and it suffocated. Perhaps there was some invisible fault in the making. A dead lamb looked so small, I wondered if something was wrong with it, undersized, early. But when I picked it up by the hind legs and carried it out to bury it, the lamb felt heavier than I had expected. 
as long and heavy as the others. It was only its sodden stillness, its wool covered with the gunk of birth, clinging like wet mold to the sunken body instead of drying and filling out. And I'm going to skip a little bit of these things. Later, I go back to the barn to gather the animal feed pans to wash them. Everything is wet, muddy, shit covered. I spread the plastic basins in the yard and hose them off. It's cold out. The cold coast range is hidden by clouds. I try to remember the summer drought, as it's called, that time in the Willamette Valley when everything dries out and it never rains, sometimes for as long as June to November, leaving our oaks dusty, turning grass to gold and bare earth to a hot stone. It's a delicious time of year. The grapes ripen as their leaves turn yellow, dry, and part to reveal the thick clumps of fruit. The air tastes like hot apples, and you can smell the honey in the hives heating up from yards away. All day, turkey vultures soar on thermals over the valley. We walk around wearing shorts and skimpy little shirts, bare feet and sandals we can slip off when we sit down to cool our heels. The sheep lounge under the oak shade at midday, chewing and digesting. The lambs will be fat, weaned, and well-grown by then, but no one has to go to auction yet. It's too hot and dry even for mosquitoes. Of course, if it goes on too long after the grapes have been picked, we all start yearning for rain, desiring the wet air, the dove gray sky, the comfort of the fire in a wood stove on a drizzling day. And now we've had it with rain, and it's mud time. Bill goes by the vet to pick up a shot for the ewe with the dead lamb. The lamb has been buried under the lilacs. Bulging with her unborn lamb, Flora wanders up to the fence and noses around for st stray treats. I remember the time Flora had a lamb in the upper oak grove on a rainy winter day a couple of years back. I brought it in out of the weather. She followed me to the barn, but then didn't want to get penned because although she saw her lamb in the barn, she thought confusedly, maybe it was also still up in the oaks. When I tried to block her in the barn, she charged at the door and banged me in the knees so hard I flew completely off my feet, came down on my back in the mud and knocked my wind out. For a few minutes, I wanted to kill her. Flora's mother is Aurora. Flora is in the mythic line, along with her older sister, Echo. <laughs> we also have the Good Spirits line of names, Amity, Harmony, and Eftahia, which means happiness in Greek. The Vegetation line, Clover and Holly. This is like the ewe and their lambs, if you understand so. The Sweets line, Toffee, Fudge, and Honey. And another set, I'm not sure what to call, except that it has for me a nice attitude. Why, fancy, and grace. <laughs> Every once in a while, we throw in a lamb name that doesn't fit a category, like Dagmar or Gloria or Bella's twins, Elvis and Elton John. <laughs> but I tried to keep the associations because it's part of my record keeping. Besides these associations of meaning derived from their mother's names, we also named the lambs according to the alphabet. This muddy February, we're in the J year. That's 10 years of keeping sheep. On a day like this, I think, maybe I shouldn't name anybody this year. It makes it easier. Maybe I should get out of the sheep game altogether. Muck and mud and midnight lambings, looking for sheep sitters when I want to go out of town. I raise my kids. Do I really need sheep? Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Maybe what I really need is a pot of those big red tulip, tulips from Payless. I go back to the barn to check on Amity's lambs. She has twin ewe lambs born a couple of days ago. Amity is our oldest ewe now since Y and Toffee died. She had udder damage a couple years ago, perhaps from over-enthusiastic lambs. Lambs butt their mother's udders to get the milk to come down, so she has milk only on one side. It would be easier if she had just a single lamb, but she al almost always has twins. The twins are taking turns nursing, and she seems to have a lot of milk on the one side, so maybe it will be okay. I give them supplementary bottles just in case to get them started. Amity is white, but she often has black lambs. 
These two black ewe lambs are oddly mismatched in size. One of them is twice the size of the other. She looks a lot like Elvis. The other looks like a sturdy runt, like Amity in black. She has a high-pitched, insistent baw, like one of those tippy toys, which won't let Amity forget her. She is really little. I worry that the big lamb will get most of the milk, so I go out with a bottle, pick up the runt, and lay her across my knees. A three or four inch scrap of umbilical cord dangles from her belly like a dry stalk of grass. It'll fall off in a few days. I've got mud on my socks and a dab of sheep shit on my jeans. Outside the dim barn, it starts to rain again, but I spread fresh straw right after breakfast and it's nice in here. Through the door, I see the coast range purple behind a veil of rain and mist. The lamb drinks well from the bottle, sucking the milk replacer into her triangular little black head. She has an earthy smell, partly the smell of birth, partly wool, partly sheep piss, but it's a nice smell. Her tail wiggles as happy lamb's tails do when they eat. Her black eyes shine. There is a spot of white on her nose. The J year. I think I'll call her Joy. So, not exactly a Valentine poem, but uh, seasonal anyway. I do have an old poem that I wrote for Valentine's Day about 30 years ago. So I would like to read that. It's a little longish. Maybe I should read something short first. No, I'll read this first. Okay. And I was in a writing group. And we just said, we'll write Valentine poems for the next group. And Valentine poems, you always think at first of something really sweet and everything. And I thought, I'll just go the other way. But it is a lecture on the heart. <clears throat> Let's understand a heart is something like a pill. You swallow it, it beats away a time capsule without which you're just a shell. Looks nothing like a valentine. A valentine heart is probably something sexual dressed up in daddy's clothes. A male genital disguised for mailing. A, upside down a Victorian lady's ass pinched at the waist and so on. Or maybe it's one of those linguistic mistakes. In fact, a hearth, which might in turn have been a sort of great the Anglo-Saxons used for roasting a haunch of venison on the first day birds returned in spring, which is supposedly St. Valentine's Day. It's important not to confuse the real with the imaginary and superficial, such as red paper sentiments bordered by good white intentions with holes in them, probably made of scraps. A real heart is more like a bloody radish crisp and hot and edible, a fist-like muscle in the warm body, always slightly off-center in people. In fact, St. Valentine himself also had nothing to do with hearts or love or birds. A Christian martyr of the third century, St. Val sits next to St. Vitus in the dictionary. St. Vitus, that's my patron, a funny old uncle who taught me how to dance lit fireworks in the ganglia after dark, forbid me one whole year to play in the heart as if it were a dangerous city park. The heart is more like a room, actually. I walked inside the one at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, a heart big as the museum bathroom. I peered down the left ventricle, and I peered down the right ventricle, an irrelevant clot with a camera on my neck till the children pulled me through and we went on to the lungs, the clean white lungs of plastic and the brown ones of the man who died smoking, poor tarry paper bags like wasp nests in their glass case. On the other hand, I remember the smallest heart I've ever seen was the one my friend Billy cut out of a swallow he'd shot. He put it on a blue plate along with the liver for his sick yellow cat. The cat would not eat, continued to puke and die. That day, his mother was making sour cream fudge, which she poured to cool on a slab of black and white veined marble. 
little bird hearts make repulsive candy. And I'd rather make soup of my old valentines, simmer them till the cupids like onions are soft and the small hearts float to the top and burst, which is how you know when hearts are done, they pop. No, that's a lie and I promise to tell it straight that hearts break is purely mythical. They just get soft, they just get stopped or go limp and soft like old leaky hot water bottles. Unlike the famous woman fashion designer whose lover shaved her pubic hair in the shape of a valentine heart, we will remember what the heart really is. The heart is not genital, it is not a public bathroom, it is not made of paper or fudge or bird feathers. The heart is not a martyr or a rare disease. The heart, the heart, the heart is a muscle. I don't think they have that heart at OMSI anymore. You know, they used to have it up the old place, uh, uh, up on the hill by the zoo. But they didn't replace it down in the new OMSI, did they? <laughs> but it was great to go in and poke around with the kids in the heart and see what was going on there. So. Now I will move on to something maybe a little sweeter or something. Oh no, can I have lost? There is a poem I want and it's not here. Oh well, I've got some other. So I'm going to look in my... I'll tell you the title. <laughs> It was called Love Over 60. Oh, here it is. Good. Okay. I did find it after all. All right. <laughs> okay. Love Over 60. Now, this is kind of a poem which I think shows the remarkable ability for the human mind to make associations even if there's sort of a um, nothing really there. <laughs> Well, maybe there is. Okay. Here's to the slippery and the stiff, the biscuit and the fish, the tight and the loose and the in-between. Here's to remembering and looking forward and the size of the moment, the round and the soft and the saggy of the moment, the wrinkles like a well-used map of the moment. Treasure the blur of seeing up close and the distance in the lens. Blessed be the furry and the fuzzy, the hairless and the taut, the slow and the fast and whatever comes next. Let the race be to the leisurely, the silk and the wool and the cotton, the pills and the table, the magazine, the now and the then and more often, the wrinkled sheet, the coffee in bed, the toenail and the armpit, the thumb joints and the arches, the bathroom and the leaky flashing around the chimney, the sound of the refrigerator humming like an old, old song, and all the rest of it. And here's one. I'm trying to do some nice Valentine poems instead of, you know. Okay. The Amazing 71-Year-Old Husband, a love poem. I used to be strong, he says, after spending the day pressing wine, lifting the vats of fermented purple juice, pouring it all into the press, winding the screw down against the mast, funneling the liquid into five-gallon carboys, then lifting and carrying each one into the wine room. Last week he chopped wood, then plowed the garden for fall. I used to be strong, he says again with a sigh. Silly husband, amazing husband. <laughs> and here is one. True. What? It actually did use the Um And this one um, is about my mother and father. My father was a photographer. He died in 1992. Um, 
and we have a lot of his pictures, and it's wonderful to see his pictures and look at them, uh, and the old boxes of photos and so on, because when you look at a photographer's pictures, you see what they were seeing through their eyes again. And this is about a picture of my mother that he took. In the eye of one who loves you. The sand dunes fill the picture, their ribbed surfaces like sand at low tide. The shadows behind each dune black as the other side of the moon. And there is my mother, a tiny figure walking across the sand. I imagine she likes looking at this photograph because it reminds her of being in my father's eye as from a distance he took the picture. He is gone now, but in this picture he always has his eye on her. And this one, uh, the ones on the paper, some that are in the manuscript I'm working on now. And, uh, so on, and then I'll go to some in the books. But this one isn't a, a Valentine poem, so we're making a transition here into another part of the reading. Matters of Faith. It's quite short, okay. Matters of Faith. When I drive on the freeway, or especially on a four-lane road with no divider, and travel believing that no one will come across the center line and run into me. It is almost like believing in something bigger than us all, a comet keeping to its path, the continuing power of the electric company, an oak tree not falling when you walk under it, God even. You know, do you ever drive down the road and you think, Thank God those people are staying on their own side, <laughs> and you hope they do. <laughs> you don't want to think it too much, <laughs> probably, but um, I have those thoughts. You know, I don't have a watch, so... What time is it? Well, after seven. What is it? Oh, there is. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. That's right in front of me. Why didn't I see that? Okay. And there are many kinds of love, including love for children. So I'm going to read a poem of, that I wrote for my daughter, who is now in her 40s. And I, I, again, it's in this book that you know, his older poems. Um, she's never been fully able to get away from this poem. Once in a while, somebody will read this book and they say, well, I'll tell you what they say after I read the poem. Because <laughs> it was when she, she was little. Monica, dear Monica, do you realize each time I sit down to the typewriter or with a book, you appear asking me to look at your hair, <laughs> how it will or will not curl, asking if I prefer it with combs or the barrette, asking should you have it cut, do I think it's getting long enough, asking me which way do I like it best than doing the opposite. <laughs> you ask me to admire the one perfect side and abhor the other, then won't open your door because I agree with you. You pull it back from your clear brow, push it down and consider bangs, turn before me like a small planet haloed by hair and in orbit. I have to admit, I'm bored with your hair. <laughs> I do love your hair. I love the rest of you also. When you were born, I admired your hair more than you could ever do. Hair like black kitten fur with strange light streaks. Even the nurses sang, such hair, what hair? It would not be slicked down with the tiny brush. You were my plush teddy bear. Ever since I've combed and brushed and washed it, 
Even the time you ran away, stark naked into the pasture, brown silk streaming, your feet churning, so I could hardly catch you. I brought you back under one arm and washed your hair. Now look at you, who would have believed you would wash your own hair so well and so often? <laughs> 13-year-old daughter discovering the mirror, wanting to make me into your mirror, too. Don't you know I've been your mirror all these years? But today, I don't want to be an audience. Today, I'm bored with your hair. All right, don't look at me like that. Don't throw yourself across your bed face down like that. Oh, what a reproving back. Oh, how your hair flies out fiercely like lightning on your pillow. I'm sure I'd get a shock if I were to touch it. Dear Monica, I just happened to notice. I want to know. I really have to ask, how did you achieve that striking effect? That's better. A little smile at least. Now let me ponder the way your hair falls along your neck. Shall we part it on the side or in the middle? It feels like living silk. What luxury. Someday these decisions will be beyond my reach or you won't care. You know this is blackmail, daughter, 13-year-old daughter. But let me look, oh, just look at your hair. No, I would wish her back into being 13 again, except that she has a three-year-old and I can comb her hair. <laughs> Mavis has got great hair. And um, what I said, the people will say once in a while, they say, oh, Monica, let me look at your hair. <laughs> Teaser. <laughs> uh, that, and um, so on. But today, she called. I talked to her for a minute on the phone. She said, I got my hair cut today. <laughs> so she reported in. Um, this is a poem about a romance gone wrong. It's a ballad, but I won't sing it. If there's anybody here who wants to record and sing this song and put it on a record, that's okay with me. But I can't sing. The Poetess of the Coquille. Now, these are real characters that I'm talking about. If you're familiar with Oregon history, you know that there was an early American, I mean, Oregon poet named Minnie Myrtle Dyer who lived down on the Coquille River, and her reputation was mainly local, so she was called the poetess of the Coquille. And um, Joaquin Miller, the famous, or much more famous writer who wrote, um, you know, Behind the Gray, the, the Gray Azores, or whatever, that poem about the going up, about Columbus, right? <laughs> yeah, um, came and romanced her. The silver dollars glittered on his saddle and his horse. Oh, let me say for a minute, it's a, it's a dialogue where they're talking back and forth. And I tried to use a lot of the conventions of the ballad to form with the plants and all that stuff that you get in old uh, border, border ballads. <clears throat> the silver dollars glittered on his saddle and his horse when dark-eyed Joaquin Miller came riding through the gorse to Minnie Myrtle Dyer, whose words reached like a song to the valley where he listened from the coast where she belonged. O oh, lovely coastal lady, your voice is like a shell. I want for my collection and the rest of you as well. <laughs> oh, greedy dark-eyed stranger, go down upon the sand where you'll find shells aplenty. I will keep my voice in hand. Sweet Minnie Myrtle Dyer, come up upon my horse and ride away with Miller through the trees and through the gorse to the city far away and leave this foggy coast where the rivers run so chilly and the sun is but a ghost. Oh, foolish Mr. Miller, the forest is my home. The rivers shine like salmon and I do not care to roam. Oh, Minnie Myrtle Dyer, never have I heard a woman with a poet's voice and the spirit of a bird. Well, your silver dollar saddle does not look so soft or choice, but spirit calls to spirit and voice must speak to voice. 
So he drew her up behind him, and behind them she did ride, until they sang the sea behind, and sang away the tide, and all the rivers narrowed, and the trees pulled apart. Then his love thinned with the rivers, and he broke poor Minnie's heart, like a shell in some collection one no longer cares to keep. The poet was in exile. The bird had gone to sleep. She lies buried in the city on a far, far different coast where the rivers run so chilly and the sun is but a ghost. I thought it was interesting when I read about her that um, I got the idea that when he just came romancing her, it didn't, it, she wasn't tempted until he spoke to her as poet to poet and, and she appreciated and responded to that. So but she was buried in a pauper's graveyard in New York, I think. She died there. So she should have stayed down on the coquille. <coughs> I want to read now a few poems out of a um, chapbook that came out a couple years ago maybe longer ago than that. I don't know. Time goes by too fast when you're waiting for books to come out. Uh, and um, published by Trap Rock Press. It's edited by Eric Mueller, who lives down in, in um, Eugene and has done a heck of a lot for poetry here in Oregon, as Bill Siverly has with publishing and so on. And um, so these aren't Valentine poems, but they're more about the place where we live. Bill and I moved out from Portland out to Yamhill County about 20 years ago because I was teaching at Linfield and for four years I drove. Hey, I see somebody there. Ah, how good to see you, Shira. She lives up the river now, but her folks are in this town, right? Yeah. When we came into town, I said, this is where Shira's family lives. <laughs> but where are all your children? Oh, they're with my parents. Oh. <laughs> I have to see Doctor. She is, her youngest child is called Doctor. <laughs> Dr. Welp. Okay. It's amazing. I can hardly go on. It's so great to see you. <laughs> oh no. I had one of those last week. How are you feeling? <laughs> yeah. Must be the season for grinding your teeth, I think. <laughs> yeah. You okay? Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Well, um, the first one, let's see. Figure out my time here. Well, I'll just pick a few of these and see how the time goes. This one is the owl. The owl swiveled its head and looked at me from the shelf inside the cabin in the light of my flashlight. A small owl from the woods had come in the window while I was gone. I grabbed a downfield jacket and cast it around the bird's body, picking it up and carrying it out to the porch. It didn't struggle or try to bite me. I could feel how light it was the down of its small bo bony body and its hot featheredness. I could feel the swiveling of its head and the beating of its owl's heart. Then I tossed it up in a motion that seemed to go right to my toes. I felt I could fly from the porch as the owl took off, its wings spreading into something large as an overcoat, pulling me out of myself so I could fly for a moment in the dark. I mean, if you can imagine, I hope the poem does it, but you know, getting this owl real fast so it would hurt itself and then tossing it. And then I put my arms up like that with its wings, and it was like, oh, gosh. You know, it was an amazing feeling. Well, as I said, Bill and I moved out to this farm, and, and so that was the source of a lot of poems for a while, and still is. Um, and um, as well as the essays. So these are some of those poems. So 
So this one is a piece of cake, and this is prior to my recent retirement, when I was still having to get up and go to work every day and would get up and run out and so on. Piece of cake. Did you get a lunch, my husband asked, as I was about to run out the door. Oh, no, I said, went back and grabbed some cheese, threw it between two pieces of bread, tossed it in a sack. Wait, he said, I saved you a piece of cake. Half of that, I said. I watched him cut the cake in half. I hoped he would like the other half. I watched him tear a piece of wax paper, wrap it carefully around the cake, making a nice package. He put it and an orange in my sack. His fingers were stained from husking walnuts. The cake had walnuts on it. He had his red plaid jacket on to walk me to the car. Blue fog outside was lifting. I said, if lonely spirits were here, they'd look at us and think how good it is to be alive. He said, are spirits lonely? Don't they have any place to go? Two different mindsets, but we get along very well. <laughs> <laughs> and the title poem of this. <clears throat> We used to have lots of sheep and lots of chickens. We're kind of t cutting it down now in the retirement years and so on. We're down to four chickens right now. Actually, two mistakes, two roosters and two chickens. Do you have any roosters? Sure. Just one now. Oh, good. Coyote. <laughs> Coyote? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Clot of shadows in a tree. My missing chicken, the gold one, her feathers through branches are bright like the moon that shines now through tattered rain clouds, dark bruises on the, rain, on the moon's face. I slip leathery toes between my fingers, pull her from the branch. Her feet are hot, my hand in the hand. I dangle her to keep her quiet as I climb back down. She goes limp and wings droop, a chicken handbag. In the coop, I place her upright, balancing her with both hands. As she teeters on the roost, her red and gold sisters cluck disapproval but make room in their sleep. The fox will not get you this time, oh no. The gray fox will pass by here tonight. Um, has it, how many of you have ever had chickens? Quite a few. You know how they are when you take them by their feet and you hold them upside down to keep them from, and they just kind of go unconscious. So up until you turn them upright again. Probably wouldn't want to keep them that way very long. As um, I sort of quit, you know, really we've quit raising sheep. We just have six old ewes and a, and a ram left, and we're not getting into the big lamb thing, although we may have a couple of lambs, but um, I really, it's not the same, obviously, but it's kind of like when you have children and you say, okay, that many, that's enough, you know, and you say, oh, that many, <laughs> you know, <laughs> have that or ladies do anyway, you know, babies. And sort of have that feeling about lambs, and so when I think about that, the interesting sensations of going out in the night and getting a lamb, and the way lambs feel, and so when they're newborn, taking care of them. This poem came out of that. Lamb. To fall to the hay-covered ground like a pocket of light. To be nappy, to be wet, to be tufted, and feeling of a large principle. Licked by lips large as lions, but warm and wet and muttering. To be nickered to, to be called out of the dark red vein, to be called from the swim, from the antecedents of time, wanting sleep, wanting not to waken from the twisting, turning plunge of the wet bathosphere. Being all enfolded, all wet folds of friendly, fragrant flesh, then squeezed forth and dropped, nickered over and licked dry. To be prodded with a flickering tongue, a warm tongue, tasted and tickled and spoken to in small voices. To be hunted out of the dim, warm chamber, pressured and expelled, 
dropped into the dung-smelling hay, dropped like a parcel from majesty, to separate like the yolk of an egg and inhale like a hot, wet balloon. And I will just read a couple more and then if you have questions and things. Can you talk? This one? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have it on the list. So I think maybe, okay, I'll read three more. They aren't too long. Hold on. Well, um, when I was born, my parents lived on a farm in Kansas and raised sheep. And we had a border collie. And I was two when we left there, and I don't remember any of it. But here I am, living in Yamhill County with sheep and, a, and two border collies and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think of these things in this poem. Well, life on some planet. Sunlight on sheep's backs in winter looks like sunrise on a different planet. I've never been to another planet, but I was born in Kansas in 1939. Grandfather sat in the moon wearing a derby hat in Kansas. The man in the moon was my grandfather. In 1962, a peasant on Corfu asked me, the moon we see here, can you see it in America? They were stomping grapes for wine. One grandfather gave me my first sips of wine from sunbathed vines in his Kansas garden. The other raised moon white sheep. I don't remember him, but here I am in Oregon, old as my grandfather's, watching moonlight on grapevines, sunshine on sheep's backs. <coughs> and then... <coughs> This last one is uh, Bill and I take walks every day with our dogs, but it's good, or the dogs are walking us, you know, as people say. And uh, it's just great for us and the dogs to know that you need to get out and take that walk every day. And um, often we walk the same route, but then sometimes we drive out a little ways and park and then walk from there or go to different places. And we're surrounded by lots of country roads, so there are a lot of places to walk. And there is one road that when we say we want to try that one, it's called, we call it the road with no wires. And you can imagine, there are almost no roads where you don't have telephone or electric wires. And this is a very rural road. I don't know if the, I mean, it just happens to not have any development on it. So it's the road with no wires, or the road without wires. <coughs> and I was also trying to do, to use a certain meter, so I hope it doesn't drive you crazy, because it's a meter that's hard to use in a poem without feeling really boom, 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 I mean, boom, 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 boom. But it was, that was part of the exercise of writing this. Now what would work better for that meter than, a, than walking, dun, 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 you know? Out on the road with no wires, we went walking where rose hips and apples were softening with winter and birds flew like raindrops, shook out of the treetops. Bees that once swarmed us stayed deep in the hollows of old oaks decaying and empty at center. We went past the nursery where bright baby trees sat in brave little rows turning color as if they knew what it all meant getting ready for winter, sinking their roots down each in its small pot. We walked past the strawberries, green still but sodden, with no hint of red from the berries long eaten or fallen and rotten or stolen by birds who passed over in numbers of dozens and hundreds like minnows you see in streams in the summer, darting and flashing and gone to the shadows. Down the road with no wires, we walked with our black dogs, imagining time had gone backwards and we too had rolled back with time a wave that comes sneaking 
and knocks you down gently, rolls you and takes you. No houses, no phone poles, no pavement, just gravel on the road between hillsides, rolling and fertile. A marsh hawk, intent on finding some dinner, slid over the road with no phone poles or power wires and shadowed our walking. The dogs looking up was what caused us to see it. Its fierceness was fine, a face without humor and utterly open, curious and focused, but most, I think, loving the feeling of flying. I know that I'd like to be able to fly, but the road without wires on foot was so pleasant, so colored by red stems and bright yellow foliage, rose hips and red haws of hawthorn and hedges, blue jays and woodpeckers, one green-headed sapsucker, winter wheat sown and just coming green, black tilted hot hillsides, lichen on oak trees, charcoal their branches bare on the sky, and with no phone wires showing, no poles and no houses, we just kept on walking and talking like children of memories and meals and wishes and stories of trips we had taken and people we knew once, wherever thought rambled, my sweetheart and I. Thank you. You want to ask any questions or talk about anything or mill around? Yeah? The last one you just read, could that actually, could you read that without that staccato? I mean, is it possible that poem could be read differently? Well, I try not to emphasize it too much. I don't no, know. That's what I'm getting at. I mean, but you know, it's like. A poem that is that way. It's, I challenge my students sometimes to write a poem in the rhythm of a limerick and see if they can make a serious poem out of it, and I have yet to see one. I love him and you died. And da, da, da. You know? <laughs> it's hard, but I don't know. It's like, I let it come through, but how can I, let's see. What page was that? Oh. On the road with no wires, we went walking where rose hips and apples were softening with winter. <laughs> and birds flew like raindrops shook out of the treetops. I could put the pauses in different places than where I have the lines, and it would change it a little bit. But Why not the rhythm? What? Why do you fight the rhythm? Oh, I don't, I don't with that. I definitely <laughs> thought it was okay. It's just that you don't want the rhythm to just sound like a clock, or to, you know. I well, a met metronome is helpful in music. You want to keep the, the beat, but um, it's, it's fun to do that. But anyway, if anybody writes a limerick with a serious intent, let me see it. Could you talk about your book? Writing poetry? About writing poetry? Yes, the book, how long it took, how that came about. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, you want to hear that? Um, I, when I, I lived in Michigan for 16 years with my first husband and when my kids were little and so on. And um, I had little kids, so I stayed home for a while after graduate school, and he went to work at the University of Michigan State. And then I was trying to get back into teaching, and they had a nepotism clause, and they wouldn't let me teach in the English department. Fortunately, it, uh, along came the NEA, and they set up a program for writers in the schools. So I worked in that, hmm, I'm not sure how many years, several years, when my kids were little. And you'd go out to schools, and they'd pay you $100 for working, doing a workshop and so on. And at that time, there was a book by Kenneth Koch, or Koch, is that how you say it? Mm -hmm. Called Wishes, Lies, and Dreams, which was a very good book, and it helped a lot of teachers get, uh, in t get poetry into the classrooms. And I read that, but it felt too limited to me. I needed more than those options that he was giving. So I started making up my own exercises. Now, this is kind of a longish story, and I'll try and shorten it. So I'd make up exercises, some of them while I was right there. And I was teaching kids from kindergarten through 12th grade. And um, so 
I had this big fat notebook of exercises I'd made up. And sometimes I would make them up as I was standing in the class and sort of look at the kids and think, what do these kids need? And I just think, okay, you know, write down your name. And I mean, this is a common one, but you know, and you're going to use every letter of your name and write a poem <laughs> you know, or something like that. And a lot of them were more complicated, but I still made them, a lot of them were impromptu at the time. And I'd write them down so I wouldn't forget them and use them. So then somebody asked me if I would teach a class at Michigan State for teachers. Um, I can't remember if it was an adult ed or something. And so I used my notebook. And so then they noticed that. And so uh, an editor from Harcourt Brace, it used to be called Harcourt Brace Jovanovich, was on campus and, um, you know, we're talking quite a long time ago. The, the Writers in Schools was at the beginning of the 70s. The editor showed up on campus 10 years later after I'd been doing this. And by that time I was teaching at the university in a different department. But, uh, and he asked somebody I knew if she knew anybody who had a poetry textbook because uh, there wasn't really a poetry textbook. And she said, oh, she's got this notebook. So he came to my office, looked at the notebook, and invited me to send a proposal to the thing. And that sounds like it just falls into your lap, but actually I wrote a proposal, which means you write three chapters in the outline and all that stuff, sent it, and they didn't quite like it, and they sent it back and said, will you do another thing here, the, what we didn't like? So I did that, so it took about two years to get it accepted and it came out first in 1983, and, um, and then they just keep selling it, and it's used all over the place. Uh, the price of the book always makes me feel bad because it's really expensive. It's like $60 or something, but you find used ones too. But when it first came out, the idea was to make a low-cost textbook, and I think it cost $15.95, uh, you know. 25 years ago when it first came out. And it's been through two editions. And I've never done a third edition because they keep selling the company to somebody else and it's now Heinley. It's the same, you know, at one time I got my royalty check from CBS and another time from somebody else. And so, you know, and the companies keep buying each other up. And, and uh, it became, oh, Harcourt Brace Jovanovich got rid of Jovanovich and then it became, then the Brace. <laughs> Then it became Harcourt, and then Harcourt went somewhere. They divided up. And so anyway, it was bought by this other company now, so it's Heinley. But I just heard that it's called something else now. And I can't remember what it is. But when I get my statement for this year, it'll show what it is. Do you remember what the letter was, you, the return on that? I thought, who is this? And they've divided it up. It's business stuff, you know. You don't know. But I really... I am proud of the book because it makes a really good complete beginning course in poetry. It's yeah. And it's like, you know, it's aimed at college rather than where I first started those exercises. But to me, that doesn't matter because you adjust them for the audience and um, so on. So, is that what you want to know? How it came about? Yes. <laughs> yes, because I've used it in. Two different classes. It's oh. a standard. Uh huh. And yeah, it's I mean, as I said. It, it gives you mixed feelings because, like, if I go to a conference and I'll have a name tag and somebody say, oh, You're Barbara Drake, and they don't say, oh, The author of Small Favors. They say, The author of Writing Poetry. You know, Oh, do you write? You know, <laughs> no, they don't say that, but you know. Uh, I would like to sell as many poetry books as I've sold the textbooks, but I'm not rich either from it. It's just been a steady seller over the years, and it's very nice to have it out there. And I've used it in classes myself, and uh, I've, you know, I love the way it works myself because I put all these great poems in it, and um, I have a lot more that I wanted to put in, but you always get, the editors always make you take some of the stuff out because it costs too much and so on to, you know. And maybe that's another reason why, I have, besides all these changes of uh, publishers' companies that are really the same thing but changing forms, every time you do a new edition you have to negotiate the prices of things. 
the permissions. And I know that when I did it the first time, poets were giving me poems for $50 or something like that. Now they want $400 or something you know, or more. If there's somebody who has, is very famous and has died, you couldn't afford to put an Anne Sexton poem in there, I don't think. Um, you know, you have to really have a big budget to do that. Yeah? What? I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to say it is a wonderful book. I, I, it's, I could open it when I came to school without a lesson and find something that I could adapt when I was teaching my school. I learned from it. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's just a wonderful book. Thank you so much for Oh, well, thank you. Uh, it was a learning process for me, <laughs> the whole pro process of getting it there, you know, and, and when you put it in a textbook, you don't want to be wrong with things either. You look and you have to do a lot of reading and making sure you're not giving somebody the wrong idea about something or somebody or a poem. And, um, it's clear. It's beautifully written. Oh, well, thank you very much. But, you know, a lot of those, as I said, were made up without a lesson plan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where I'd be somebody like, hmm, this is what we'll do today. I would come with a different plan, and then I'd get an idea and just do that and said, hey, Bill. What's the Stafford poem in the book? Um, there are, the there's the revision one. Yeah, and what's that? It, well, I asked Bill for a poem that she, where he had revisions. And he gave me manuscript and the poem, and all of a sudden I can't think of the name on the spot. I can't think of the name of that one. Dorothy and then, asked. Okay. Well, I asked him the name of your writing book. Oh, <laughs> it's writing poetry. Well, look in the back and, te and tell me the names. There are the, <coughs> this one, which has, his, I have reproductions of his, his funny writing in it, which you can recognize a mile away, can't you? <laughs> Yeah. So I have um, the poem ending with and is in there, but that's not the, that's not, uh, the one with the revision. Is it called The Farm? Uh, no, The Farm on the Great Plains is not the one I'm thinking of for the thing. So look under Stafford and under the things and see how many are there. There's four. Yeah. The animal that drank up sand. Right. The epitaph ending in Anne. Right. Of the farm on the Great Plains. Yeah. But and what's the revision one? The tombstones back home. Yeah, the tombstones back home. That was the one where he gave me the the uh, manuscript to look at. I returned it though. <laughs> but made copies where you could see all his revisions, which was fascinating because um, you just see this rough manuscript to begin with and then it changes and it's pulled together and so on and you just I recognize the process but when you look at somebody else's revisions it's fascinating. So other hmm. other questions or anything? Comments? Well if there are no more questions the thing that I forgot to, to say in the introduction is that Barbara has a, a new collection of poetry coming out? Right. I Driving don't know when 100. it'll be out. I hope this year, but it's called Driving 100. And uh, it will be published by Fairweather Press from Bedbug Books, which is a publisher down in Brownsville that's done a book of Paul Ann's. Anybody else here have a book published from there? Anyway, it's really a nice press, and so I'm excited about that. I'm not sure when it'll be out, but wish it were out today. <laughs> you know, this year is I hope so. Yeah, you know, he works on a budget and small staff and so on, but um, it gives me a chance to keep changing things, <laughs> which is something I can't stop doing until it's in print. <laughs> well, we all thank you very much for being here. Please stay. There are three back here and coffee. And stay for conversation. Let's get Barbara to the